thank you all for coming out tonight or for joining us on YouTube. My name is Shelby Disney and I'm a McConnell Scholar here at the University of Louisville. Tonight we continue our year exploring variety left and right where we're seeking understanding of the variety of political, social, and economic thought in America today. We urge you to catch up on this year's programming on the McConnell Center's YouTube page or the McConnell Center podcast where you can hear previous lectures in this series. This evening we have the distinct honor of hosting Daniel McCarthy. Daniel McCarthy is the editor of the historically very important intellectual journal, Modern Age, editor at large of the American Conservative Magazine. He's write, his writing has appeared in the New York Times, USA Today, The Spectator, The National Interest, Reason, and many other publications. Outside of journalism, he has worked as internet communications coordinator for a presidential campaign and editors of ISI Books. His most recent work includes writing the foreword in Wilmore Kendall's The Conservative Affirmation. He's a graduate of Washington University in St. Louis, where he studied classics. Tonight, his lecture is entitled Conservatism, Populism, and Caesarism. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dan McCarthy to the McConnell Center. Well, thank you very much for that uh, kind introduction. It is a, a great honor for me to be here speaking to the McConnell Center, and uh, I'm delighted that uh, those of you who are here in person are joining me, and also that those of you listening online are able to tune in and hopefully gain the benefit of what I have to say here. You know, until about five years ago, I would say that most people who had a sort of common knowledge of conservatism would point to two characteristics of American conservatism. They would say that, well, it generally stands for limited government. And this was something which had been uh, an earmark or a, a, a characteristic quality of American conservatism, at least as far back as Barry Goldwater. Barry Goldwater was the Republican nominee for president back in 1964. He was seen as being uh, kind of the first modern post-war conservative leader who had a shot at becoming president. And of course, in the 1964 election, uh, you had just recently had the, uh, the murder of uh, President Kennedy the year before. And so the chances that uh, Barry Goldwater had in 1964 were not really all that good. Nevertheless, um, it was kind of shocking uh, that he won the Republican nomination in 1964. He came from the right side of the Republican Party. He was an outspoken conservative. And uh, at the time, in the 1960s, conservatism was seen as being a relatively new development in American politics something that was a little bit shocking, a little bit perhaps uh, on the edge. And so the fact that Goldwater became the Republican nominee was seen as being kind of a triumph for conservatism, even if Goldwater himself went down to a very significant landslide defeat in November of 1964. Now out of the ashes of that defeat, there actually came a much stronger conservative movement. Uh, after 1964, conservatives said, well, even though Barry Goldwater was defeated that year, he won millions and millions of votes in America. And that shows that there is a ceiling to our, uh, there's, sorry, that there's a floor to our movement. It shows that we have, you know, a firm foundation of millions of voters upon which to start building. And we can increase our vote from there. We're never going to fall below the level that Barry Goldwater established. And the level that he established was so good and so promising that this gives us real hope for the future. And already in 1964, it was quite clear that, uh, a uh, former GE spokesman named Ronald Reagan would go on to be a very important leader in the Republican Party and in the conservative movement. Uh, you know, uh, Ronald Reagan goes on to become the governor of California. And of course, uh, in 1980, he defeats uh, Jimmy Carter in the 1980 presidential election. And Ronald Reagan then becomes not just a president, but a two-term president. Uh, uh, Ronald Reagan's uh, running mate, uh, George H.W. Uh, Bush, also becomes president in 1988. And so uh, there is a line of succession that conservatives often point to, from Barry Goldwater to Ronald Reagan. And they see this as being kind of the origin story. If it were a Marvel movie, this would be you know, the point at which the uh, radioactive spider beats, uh, bites uh, Peter Parker. It's uh, Barry Goldwater you know, comes on the scene, and uh, you know, he's this great hope for conservatism. He becomes the nominee in 64. He loses that November. But out of the ashes of that defeat comes a much stronger and larger conservative movement, which ultimately elects Ronald Reagan in 1980. And Ronald Reagan to this day remains the benchmark of conservatism 
for a great many Americans, a great many Repub Republicans, but also a great many conservatives who, you know, they, they may be Republican, but they think of themselves primarily as, um, you know, people who are interested in political principles and ideas, not just in party labels. And Reagan was always very strongly identified with the idea of limited government. And you can go look. Uh, Reagan has a great many wonderful folksy quotes in which he says uh, that government is not the solution to our problems. Government is the problem. So uh, Reagan and Goldwater both represented this idea that limited government was the heart of American conservatism. Now, another idea that is very strongly associated with post-war American conservatism is a certain... Um, skepticism towards, or as critics might even say, a hostility toward democracy. And, uh, you know, right now, of course, you have a great many Democrats, a great many progressives and liberals who say that the Republican Party is undemocratic. It's not just opposed to the Democratic Party, it's actually unsmall d democratic in itself. Uh, and you see that there is this great sense right now in our country that there is a crisis of democracy and that the Republican Party might be uh, one of the sources of this crisis. But if you ask conservatives themselves, they will also tell you that uh, democracy is not necessarily the label that they would use as uh, the uh, name for the kind of representative self-government that they want to champion. So uh, it used to be a very common thing, in fact I think it still is, uh, that if you talk to Republicans or if you talk to uh, conservatives, they will tell you that America is a republic, not a democracy. So they are you know, on the side of representative self-government. But democracy often calls to mind ideas of uh, maybe a plebiscitary democracy, a uh, sort of uh, unmoderated democracy, a democracy in which you know, uh, everyone's rights and lives and property can all be you know, sort of uh, called into question at every single election. The idea of unlimited power being uh, you know, imbued into the, uh, the, the mass of the public, the democratic mass. This is something that people who believe in limited power uh, and in limited government find quite alarming. Because what happens if the public, if the, uh, you know, the, the democratic masses wind up being, um, uh, traducing the rights of minorities, traducing the rights of property holders, uh, any number of bad things can happen if democracy is not itself subject to certain kinds of limitations. So among conservatives there's often been a, um, a certain criticism of democracy, uh, which is not the same thing as a criticism of self-government, but they would say Republican self-government, small r Republican, is different from uh, pure, unmixed, unmoderated, and all-powerful uh, democracy. Well, in recent times, uh, we've seen that there is a change in the way that conservatives talk about themselves, uh, as well as the way in which conservatism is perceived, perhaps, by the public. We see that um, the idea that uh, conservatism stands for smaller government, always and everywhere, is starting to be challenged. And there are a number of folks who uh, label themselves the new right, who instead of believing in strictly limited government and the idea that the smaller the government the better, are saying that instead the key thing to do is to acquire government power and use it for the sake of what conservatives believe is good. Use it for the sake of the common good. So don't be afraid of power. Power is simply a tool and it can be used well by conservatives if they attain it. And there's nothing to be afraid of. There's nothing, no reason to say that uh, power always has to be limited, that government always has to be limited. Government can serve uh, the purposes of the people, the purposes of the public, the purposes of conservatism. So on the one hand, you see this uh, beginning of a new uh, openness towards government power on the part of many conservatives, many on the right. At the same time, and actually from a, a rather different sector of uh, uh, kind of conservative activism, you're starting to find more openness, if not necessarily to the word democracy, than to this other word called populism. Uh, this idea that what is wrong with our country is that it is governed by corrupt elites. And in order to defy the corrupt elites, in order to defeat them, you'll have to marshal the strength of the people, the public, and that the people and the public are in fact, uh, if not intrinsically good, they're certainly a lot better than the elites who are running our country. So populism, which used to be something that conservatives felt uh, was a little bit too close to absolute democracy, populism has now become something that conservatives often embrace. Now, as I say, the idea that conservatism was uh, skeptical of unlimited democracy, the idea that conservatism was on the side always of limited government, this was a kind of general impression that uh, tended to uh, be maintained up until about five years ago. And if you actually look at political history over the course of the last century, you'll see that uh, even if these were conservative principles in the abstract, in practice they didn't necessarily describe what happened in Republican politics, 
or what uh, conservatives were advocating uh, you know, in their magazines or online or uh, on television. So in practice, plenty of Republican presidents were in fact in favor of larger government and uh, supported various uh, new kinds of programs. Uh, certainly they were in favor of uh, larger military spending, for example. And even the idea of populism had a certain amount of cachet among uh, Republican voters and among uh, even some conservative thinkers going back many decades. So think about uh, an era that you may be aware of in the 1950s called the McCarthy era, not named after myself, but named after rather a senator from Wisconsin, a Republican by the name of Joseph McCarthy. And uh, Joseph McCarthy became uh, famous and then infamous for uh, calling attention to communist infiltration within the US government. And McCarthy had a tendency to exaggerate the degree of that infiltration, or at least to exaggerate the claims he made about uh, names that he could run off of government officials who were in fact you know, members of the Communist Party or you know, generally were strong fellow travelers and you know, tools of Moscow in the midst of the Cold War. So Joseph McCarthy, in you know, saying that there were these, these, these communists within American government, wound up with a following that said, um, you know, the problem with American government isn't just the card-carrying communists within it, but the fact that there are a great many uh, sort of left-wing intellectuals and, uh, you know, uh, liberals with uh, Ivy League credentials, especially in the State Department, who are really antithetical to the aims of the American people, maybe the aims of the free enterprise system, maybe the aims of the free world as it was in a cold war with uh, uh, the Soviet Union, with Russia. Uh, the supporters of Joseph McCarthy said that the problem was you know, not just communism, it was also the American elite which had become uh, quite corrupt. So the McCarthyite movement in the 1950s already had at least an undercurrent of populism to it. And uh, you also see that uh, you know, American elites in the Republican Party as well as in the Democratic Party they you know, point to Joseph McCarthy and they say, well, you know, this guy is a demagogue, this guy is dangerous, and uh, this guy is in fact completely wrong. And McCarthy winds up being censured by the uh, United States Senate, which is basically the end of his, uh, his career. So populism has an uprising in the 1950s uh, in the Republican Party in the form of McCarthyism. There is uh, also an undercurrent of populism in the rise of Senator Barry Goldwater. So uh, in 1960, Barry Goldwater didn't, didn't want to run for president at that point, but uh, there was basically a grassroots movement that tried to draft him to run for president and had some success with that. And then in 1964, Goldwater does agree to become a, you know, a candidate for president and wins the Republican Party nomination. The supporters of Barry Goldwater in 1964, they too saw themselves as being uh, political outsiders. Uh, just as Goldwater himself was from Arizona, he was not from uh, the state of New York or the state of New Jersey, he was not from sort of the East Coast, uh, you know, sort of old guard Republican elite. Barry Goldwater was seen as being kind of an outsider coming from uh, a state that, you know, at that point was still, uh, you know, within living memory of the Wild West. Arizona was, was an outsider kind of place uh, back in 1964, and Barry Goldwater was seen as being uh, this champion, this cowboy kind of arising from the frontier to go and challenge the corrupt uh, city dwellers. Um, there is a, a quote from Barry Goldwater where uh, he jokes about sawing off the eastern seaboard. Basically, you know, just uh, if you could uh, cut off, you know, the, uh, uh, all those, uh, you know, elitist states and let them drift off into the Atlantic Ocean, uh, Barry Goldwater would have been happy to do that. So the Goldwater movement does have a certain populist element as well. In the aftermath of the Goldwater uh, era, you have the beginnings of uh, a number of single issue groups. It's a time when, for example, uh, Second Amendment rights, gun rights, and uh, you know, things like um, uh, opposition to high taxes. You start to get um, you know, various organizations that are founded in order to oppose uh, high taxes and to fight for uh, amendments to state constitutions in order to uh, impose limitations on the state's ability to raise taxes. Uh, the 1970s, again, this is after uh, Barry Goldwater's day, in, uh, or after the, he had you know, uh, run for president in 64, you have this development of a grassroots right-wing conservative movement uh, in the 1970s and into the 1980s, uh, which also takes up the cause of social conservatism. It's the era of uh, the moral majority of many Christian churches, especially evangelical ones, becoming very politically active. Uh, eventually you get groups like the Christian Coalition uh, forming in uh, the late 1980s. And uh, this is also the era when abortion really enters American politics in a big way. Uh, 
So uh, Roe v. Wade, I think, is in 1974. And then it takes a few years before you start to get uh, a real conservative reaction against that. And it's a reaction which tends to take a rather grassroots form and that often has an element of populism to it, a sense of, you know, uh, the American people, if they were able to make their own decisions, would not have legalized abortion nationwide. But the Supreme Court, an unelected, uh, you know, sort of batch of very highly credentialed elite uh, thinkers, they undemocratically, uh, you know, gave us a decision with Roe v. Wade, which imposed abortion, uh, legal abortion, on the entire country. So uh, the conservative legal movement is built out of a, uh, a certain populist impulse, a certain populist uh, you know, um, discontent with the idea of Supreme Court justices uh, being able to dictate policy for the entire country. And it's interesting to look now that conservatives have had some success at claiming uh, the ju judiciary that you may start to see this turn around. Perhaps progressives and Democrats are going to become more populist and more opposed to, to the Supreme Court and the ju judiciary. Uh, if you see those, those partisan switches. But I offer that just as a, uh, a passing observation. Uh, I want to return to this idea, however, that there's always been a certain uh, populist tendency on the American right and among American conservatism. So there's been a tension. On the one hand, limited government and the idea that we are a republic, not a democracy, has been a very strong uh, tendency on the American right. This, uh, you know, sometimes you even find a certain snobbishness on the American right. Uh, this sense that, um, you know, People, uh, you, you don't want to have absolute democracy because if you did that, people who generally are not very well educated or people who might not have, you know, uh, might not be accustomed to, to dealing with uh, large uh, projects and, and, you know, sort of large amounts of property, that they would vote for redistribution, they would vote for sort of giving away other people's money uh, to themselves. There's a certain, you know, conservatism uh, which has always been concerned about that. And yet today, as you see uh, the Republican Party, and conservatism in general becoming more populist. Uh, the, the populist uh, currents, which had been rather limited in the past, seem to be growing you know, wider and wider. You also see perhaps a change in the uh, class makeup of uh, the Republican Party, that the Republican Party had often been uh, the party of uh, relatively prosperous, small local businessmen. Uh, there's a great book called After the Storm, which is uh, about Barry Goldwater and his uh, you know, 1964 campaign. It's by a left-wing historian named Rick Perlstein. Uh, but his book is quite fair, or at least that one is. And uh, after the storm basically has this wonderful section at the beginning of the book where it talks about how a lot of small businessmen felt as if they didn't have representation in Washington. Uh, they didn't have representation, they thought, either in the Republican Party or in the Democratic Party. They felt as if the New Deal, uh, which had taken place you know, 30 years earlier, that the New Deal was basically um, uh, a, a, a way of strengthening big business at the expense of small business, and that the New Deal had a sort of cartelizing effect on the American economy. And even though the New Deal was sold as being good for working class and poorer people, uh, a lot of middle class businessmen and you know, sort of upper middle class businessmen saw the New Deal as something that was favoring big business over relatively uh, small businessmen such as themselves. So this became a core group in support of Barry Goldwater. There were some larger businessmen too, but uh, I think uh, Perlstein is quite right to point to you know, department store owners and others who were a, uh, you know, a sort of um, a base for the Republican Party and uh, who were, you know, they were major donors to it. They were donors to uh, conservative institutions like National Review Magazine. And um, things have started to change, however. As there are still plenty of wealthy people who are supporting the Republican Party. But you'll now see that uh, you know, not only do you have a lot of hyper-wealthy uh, tech zillionaires who are supporting the Democrats, but also the Republican Party is winning more and more voters you know, in subsequent elections from uh, voters who are lower down on the economic ladder. And especially, uh, there's not just a economic class divide, but also an educational class divide. And you see an increasing uh, component of the Republican um, coalition uh, is uh, represented by voters who do not have college degrees. College education is starting to be one of the major dividing lines in American politics, where voters without college degrees, especially if they're, they're, they're white uh, voters without college degrees, are much more likely to vote for the Republican Party. And those who do have college degrees, and especially those who have advanced degrees, are more likely to vote for the Democrats. This lends itself to a certain kind of populist polarization because you know, one of the key um, qualities of populism has typically been this critique of elites, 
including the critique of educated elites, the critique of the Ivy League, uh, and to some degree the critique of uh, higher education in general. And of course, those of you who watch the news and uh, you know, are, are reading New York Times and so forth, you have a good sense right now of the tensions between the Republican Party and higher education in the United States. Uh, and you're seeing that you know, many Republican state legislatures uh, in Florida and elsewhere are uh, becoming uh, more involved in curricula, more involved in what happens in higher education, uh, in part because they think that higher education has become uh, the source of a great many uh, of the ideas that are now driving, if not necessarily the Democratic Party, their ideas that are driving uh, progressivism uh, and a great deal of cultural change, maybe perhaps some economic change as well within our country. So you're seeing this you know, sort of magnification and development of populism uh, on the American right. It is something of a change from the older, uh, you know, sort of skeptical of, uh, you know, um, the uneducated voter kind of conservatism that had generally been, uh, you know, recognized as um, the norm for conservatism up until uh, relatively recently, really up until uh, the Donald Trump years. So there's always been a, a, a tension on the right. There's always been a, a degree of conflict between uh, the populist undercurrents on the one hand and uh, the sort of uh, general impression of conservatism as being something that is uh, critical of uh, you know, the, the people having direct uh, power in our politics. Um, but uh, over time, uh, you know, you've seen a shift basically where it's gone from conservatism being characterized primarily by ideas of limited government and ideas of, uh, you know, uh, controlled democracy or moderated democracy. And instead, uh, things are shifting over towards the idea uh, that conservatism uh, stands for a sort of war between uh, the elite and the people as different classes. And a, um, that the people and their you know, uh, representatives uh, on the right uh, among conservatives, that they could perhaps uh, take government power and use it proactively to support the things that they want to support and use it to harm perhaps uh, the other side, to harm uh, progressives and, and uh, Democrats and so forth. You have this uh, you know, very combative mentality uh, that has developed on the right, uh, in part for you know, reasons that you might be able to understand, that they, the right has uh, you know, sort of been under um, uh, you know, so much pressure culturally from having lost you know, institution after institution uh, in American life that uh, now the right is saying, well, look, if, if the only place where we really have a voice, if the only place where we are represented is in state legislatures or is in uh, you know, uh, the governor's mansion, then we should use the places where we are represented to start to exert some more power in the places where we are not represented. And that may include in higher education. It may include in the media, uh, you know, especially the social media. You see a lot of uh, conservatives and Republicans now talking about cracking down on the tech companies and uh, you know, uh, perhaps uh, saying that uh, you have to make sure that there is uh, some uh, you know, uh, capacity for conservatives to express themselves on social media and that you can't have uh, Twitter or other uh, institutions uh, censoring conservatives or shadow banning them. Uh, these are hot issues right now among conservatives and on the American right. So having said that, having given a kind of overview of where things stand and where they've come from in the post-war era, let me talk a little bit more about these fundamental concepts of populism and uh, as Caesarism in particular. So what do, what do Caesarism and populism have to do with one another? Um, you know, to, to, from a certain perspective, uh, if you don't really uh, you know, have a grounding in history, you might think that these are kind of uh, opposing forces, right? Because populism has to mean something to do with power in the people. And Caesarism, well, that means imperialism. That means you know, power being concentrated in an emperor, in a king-like figure, a figure like Julius Caesar. Well, think back to the Roman Republic about 2,100 years ago. Rome had a patrician senate. It was not an elected senate, but it was a senate that consisted of you know, wealthier and generally uh, you know, sort of more uh, uh, you know, distinguished families. Uh, they were the ones who occupied the senate. Uh, and then on the other hand, you also had a, um, a populace, the people in Rome. You may know that the, uh, the great uh, motto of Rome was uh, Senatus Populusque Romanus. That means the Senate and people of Rome. This, is the, this was Rome's identity, that it was a combination of these two elements, the Senate, the senatorial class as a whole, and the people. 
and the people were often the ones who were, uh, you know, serving in the uh, the armed forces and doing the fighting. Uh, the patricians and the senators, they were the ones uh, leading uh, Rome's armies. Rome was a tremendously effective city-state uh, in a world of city-states in terms of winning uh, wars not only against rival cities but also against large empires including the Carthaginian Empire. So what happens over the course of several centuries is that Rome wins so many wars first against its, its neighbors in Italy and then later against uh, you know, Carthaginians in North Africa, later against uh, Greeks and Macedonians uh, you know, uh, to the east of the Italian peninsula, against you know, some of these great kingdoms that had uh, you know, sprung up uh, you know, in the uh, third century BC after the conquest of Alexander the Great, things like the Seleucid Empire in what is now the Middle East and uh, the Ptolemaic Empire in uh, Egypt. Uh, Rome is able to conquer almost all of them. It defeats almost all of them. And uh, in order to continue to garrison and to govern all of these provinces that Rome is successful in conquering requires a bigger and bigger army. And a bigger and bigger army has to be paid more and more. It's going to take a larger military expenditure in order to support uh, a larger military and a military that is permanently deployed as opposed to one that fights seasonally and then comes home. Think about some of the recent conflicts that America has been in. Uh, things like the Afghan war, for example. Uh, our, our conflict in Afghanistan went for 20 years, and that required you know, billions and billions, in fact, ultimately, a couple of trillion dollars of support in order to keep that war going. Well, Rome had you know, its forces all around Europe, not just Europe, but also the Middle East and North Africa. And in order to support all of this required an enormous amount of money. This was a big change from the way that Rome had originally started doing things. Because originally Rome mostly depended on soldiers providing their own sources of support. Uh, the Roman ideal, much like the Greek ideal, was that of a citizen farmer soldier. So you went out, you enlisted in the army, you served for your time, and then you left the army, you went back to your farm, and you picked up where you'd left off. Soldiers were not paid salaries at, at first. They were expected to, you know, uh, be serving in the in armed forces as you know part of the duties of citizenship and they were expected primarily to equip themselves but when you have an empire as large as the Roman Empire had become you have to provide much more uh, resources for your soldiers the other problem is that you're taking these citizen farmer soldiers and you're putting them you're deploying them for decades at a time in places far far away from their farms so you're an Italian farmer you join the Roman military and where do you get sent? You might be sent you know, to northern Germany, or no, maybe not northern Germany, but to uh, at least you know, southern Britain, perhaps. Or you might be sent you know, to Egypt or to, uh, you know, to Israel. You could be sent anywhere, and you might be deployed for years and years at a time. What's going to happen to your farm, especially if you are a small farmer who's just you know, raising crops uh, you know, uh, with a, you know, very uh, few people helping you out? it's going to be, uh, you know, your farm is going to be ruined, basically. When, once you've served your military uh, duty and you've come back, you're going to find out that you have nothing to come back to. Well, this obviously is not going to be sustainable. So soldiers who are serving under commanders in the, uh, the Roman army, they turn to their commanders and they say, how are we going to provide for ourselves? How are we going to provide for our families? How are we going to, you know, what are we even going to think of ourselves as, as Romans if we're now disconnected from the land that we had been farming, if we're now, you know, primarily our, our, our identity as citizens is wrapped up with the idea that we've been serving in an army so far away from home. So the, the, the soldiers become increasingly uh, dependent upon and demanding upon their military commanders. And it's not the Roman state, it's not the Roman senate, that winds up uh, providing most of the support that the soldiers want. Instead, the, the military commanders themselves start to reach either into their own pockets or really they reach into uh, the you know, treasuries and the money uh, of the lands that they are, they've conquered and occupied, and they start paying the soldiers from that. There, there always, had always been a part of that in the Roman military, but it, it reaches a crisis point uh, in the first century BC where Roman military commanders, it's, it almost is, is, is as if the Roman military ceases to be the military of Rome, the army of Rome, and instead becomes a private army for every commander. Every commander is now, you know, uh, this, this incredibly, uh, you know, um, important figure for the soldiers. They depend on them. And then when these commanders eventually go back to Rome, they're often facing, first of all, uh, that they're very ambitious. They have other, you know, sort of political desires, perhaps. Uh, 
but they're also facing you know, the potential of prosecution because of all the criminal activities they probably engaged in uh, in the Roman provinces in order to uh, you know, expropriate the money from the natives that they could then use to pay off their soldiers or to you know, sort of fatten them, themselves up to you know, uh, put into their own uh, personal wealth. So there's a lot of legal jeopardy facing these Roman commanders who come back uh, after their uh, time uh, you know, in charge of provinces. Um, and so these commanders are, you know, they're, they're very much uh, concerned about the rule of law being turned against them. And they've already started to behave outside of the rule of law. And as a result, uh, you know, the commanders have what are now almost private armies at their disposal. Uh, the commanders are able to, you know, intimidate the Senate and say, look, either you, the Senate, uh, you know, create some new laws which will give rewards to our soldiers, or perhaps, you know, we'll just go in and take what we want. So a number of civil wars break out in first century uh, Rome, the first century Roman Empire. And at the end, uh, you know, towards the conclusion of these civil wars, you have uh, the, a military commander by the name of Julius Caesar, who is very close to uh, obtaining supreme power. Uh, there was actually, it's not just a, uh, you know, a description, but there's an actual title, uh, a Roman political office called the Dictator. Uh, which was meant to be, you know, just a very temporary office that you only held for short periods of time. But uh, Julius Caesar, you know, basically becomes a dictator for life. He has these indefinitely extended periods of his dictatorship. And uh, that is an amount of power which combined with other powers that uh, Julius Caesar had started to acquire, combined with the fact that he is such a, uh, you know, important figure for his soldiers who are, you know, represent the largest military force. And also uh, the fact that Julius Caesar takes all of the wealth that he had, uh, you know, sort of accumulated and starts to dole it out not just to his soldiers, but also to a lot of the common people in Rome. So Julius Caesar, you know, uh, you could basically say it's simplifying things, but it's basically like buying votes. It's basically a way of uh, becoming, uh, you know, the provider to the public when the state itself is not such a good provider, when it doesn't have a welfare state, it's not trying to, you know, uh, support the public as much as these political candidates like Julius Caesar are supporting the public. So the Roman Senate can see that it is uh, basically being overthrown, that Julius Caesar is on a path to making himself effectively a king. Uh, the Romans had you know, overthrown their kings much as we had overthrown King George III uh, you know, many uh, centuries back. And so the Romans really don't like the idea of coming under the rule of a king. Uh, the Roman Senate, uh, you know, decides to form a conspiracy and assassinate Julius Caesar. Unfortunately, that's not the end of the story, though, because uh, Caesar's heirs, his second-in-command, Mark Antony, and his nephew, Octavian, uh, they sort of pick up where Julius Caesar left off. Uh, a number of civil wars break out between, uh, you know, Octavian and, uh, uh, and uh, Mark Antony and the Tyrannicides who had killed Caesar and a number of other uh, very ambitious figures with military forces of their own. Ultimately, the winner at the end of all of this is Octavian. He becomes the first emperor of Rome. Uh, you know, he is given this exalted title as Augustus. And the very name of Caesar becomes synonymous with a kind of command in, uh, in the Roman Empire. So the first uh, several emperors, um, you know, Caesar is their, their primary title. And so this idea of Caesarism has that root, and you can see how it kind of relates to a certain kind of populism, the idea that perhaps the people come to be dependent upon uh, this one figure, uh, this unique figure, who is um, you know, both a source of support for them and who also may uh, you know, sort of overtake the government, diminish the role of the elite, diminish the role of the Senate, and instead start to create a direct relationship between this singular one political leader and uh, the great mass of the people. And it's partly a financial relationship, but it's also this idea that Caesar is your champion against uh, the corrupt Senate. And of course, you know, what begins with one particular man, Julius Caesar, and is carried on by his nephew Octavian, ultimately becomes institutionalized in the form of the role of the emperor and uh, imperial Rome. Well, let's skip ahead from the Roman Empire and look instead to Europe uh, in the medieval and early modern period. So the Roman Empire in the West collapses in the fifth century AD. And uh, you have you know, about 500 years where Europe is uh, a scene of almost incessant warfare and invasion. And then around uh, the 11th century, around the year 1000, 
things start to calm down enough that you begin to have a new sort of stable political order arising in Western Europe. I'll say just a few very general things about what that political order in Western Europe looked like. It's different from the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire, you had a, uh, an emperor. Eventually, you had two emperors, but that's a complication I won't get into right now. You had an emperor who had you know, almost all power concentrated in himself. There were very few you know, other officials who had uh, significant independent power that did not originate from the emperor. And uh, the emperor had uh, you know, a connection with a standing army. And the standing army was really you know, the most uh, important institution in the Roman Empire uh, f you know, from the beginning. So that was the way things were with the Roman Empire. Once the, the Roman Empire has fallen in the West, you still have um, a kind of monarchical rule, but it's kingly rule. And the kings who wind up uh, developing power over the course of several hundred years, they are a bit more limited than the Roman emperors. First of all, they're limit, more limited territorially, that you're now talking about kings of places like France and of England, as opposed to an emperor of all of not just, you know, almost all of Western Europe, but also North Africa and uh, the Near East. So the kings are more limited geographically. The kings in the Middle Ages and into the early modern period, they tend not to have standing armies, and they tend not to have um, the means of collecting taxes that are quite as effective as the Roman emperors used to have. Instead, the kings have a very interesting dynamic with a lot of lesser nobles. And these nobles, you know, some of them might be called dukes, some of them might, might be called barons, there are any number of titles. Uh, I won't go into the distinctions between them. But basically, these are um, hereditary noblemen who have you know, uh, lesser uh, powers and lesser territories within larger kingdoms. So in theory, the king is superior to all of these uh, local no noblemen. But in practice, uh, it doesn't always work out that way. Sometimes these local noblemen uh, you know, have so much wealth or uh, are able to hire so, much, so many mercenaries that they are, if not independent of the kings, they're certainly uh, you know, able to stand on their own two feet and to you know, defy the king's uh, demands if they wish. The life of a medieval commoner, not necessarily a peasant, but uh, certainly most people in the Middle Ages were engaged in farming, and uh, even those who were engaged in small trades, were they were typically dependent on the local nobility, much more so than on the distant king in the, in the kingdom's capital. The local nobility, uh, you know, they would have not just uh, you know, uh, a lot of land that they were in charge of themselves, but they also had uh, many of the powers that we separate in the modern world combined in the local nobility. Things like uh, they often had judicial powers, they had you know, some degree of legislative powers, and they certainly were the primary, uh, not just uh, you know, sort of executives of law within their districts, but they were also uh, very much uh, in charge of things like public works. Uh, public works were basically works that the local nobility decided they would take on, uh, or the local uh, you know, uh, bishop you know, might, might do so. But those, that was how uh, you know, things like cathedrals got built, that was how things like castles got built, but it's also the way that you know, things like uh, sewers and drainage, a lot of basic uh, you know, um, public uh, works uh, were being undertaken by the local nobility. Well, over time, in France in particular, something changes between the king and the local nobility. Um, first of all, kings start to gain more and more power over the course of the Middle Ages. And in the early modern period, the kings will be you know, uh, predominant forces. In France in particular, a kind of bargain or deal emerges between the local nobility and the king. The deal is this. The local nobility are granted a number of privileges by the king, including privileges of being exempt from taxation. And the local nobility are invited to come to Paris, the kingdom's capital, where they can live uh, lives of luxury, you know, all of the most desirable goods from the Far East, from the, you know, the Spice Islands and so forth. They're all flowing through Paris. Paris is like, it's like New York City today. It's a place where you know, uh, all of the trade connections are being made. So come to Paris where you can enjoy life's greatest luxuries, where you can enjoy a life of high fashion, where you can enjoy you know, the company of other uh, very important people. Uh, come to Paris where the king will you know, give you titles and give you honors and so forth. Come live in Paris. But of course, if the local nobility moves from uh, the regions where they have been in charge of, the, the provinces, and goes to live in the capital instead, 
who's left to be in charge of the provinces? Who's going to take charge of public works? Who's going to take charge of the administration of justice? Somebody has to do those things. What happens is that the king winds up appointing stewards and other kinds of officials who will then go to uh, the local districts and will uh, you know, be in charge of public works, they'll be in charge of taxation, they'll be in charge of the administration of justice, the whole thing. So even though the nobility still have the titles of nobility, and they have all of these privileges, both you know, their original privileges, but also these privileges the king has given them of exemption from taxes, all kinds of other things. The nobility still exists, but they're not actually doing the work that the nobility had done in the earlier part of the Middle Ages. And similarly, uh, the king is now starting to have more and more direct power over the lives of French subjects. And the king's you know, stewards are becoming more and more important officials. Well, as you get deeper into the early modern period, we're now talking, you know, uh, basically from the 15th century through to the 18th century. This uh, system of, uh, you know, government winds up collapsing. So many of you, I think, in fact, probably all of you are familiar with uh, Alexis de Tocqueville's great work, Democracy in America. But after Democracy in America, uh, Tocqueville writes another work called The Old Regime and the French Revolution. And this is a very important book. It's a small book, but it's very much worth reading. The Old Regime and the French Revolution spells out how this change had taken place in which you know, the local nobility basically desert the districts that they had once been in charge of. They go to live in the national capital, the, uh, the capital of the kingdom. And the king begins to have you know, sort of more direct power over the districts. And Tocqueville's argument is that this actually destabilizes the regime in France. It looks at first as if the king is successfully centralizing power in his hands in Paris. But Tocqueville has this brilliant insight, which is by centralizing power like that, what the king is actually doing is breaking the, the ties of uh, you know, both economic and social uh, you know, and, and customary connection, which previously had provided a sense of legitimacy within the system of French government. So what happens? Well, the wealthier sort of commoner, and by the time we're talking about the early middle, uh, uh, sorry, the uh, early modern period, these are commoners who might be engaged in you know, considerable amounts of trade, uh, they might become lawyers. So we're not just talking about medieval peasants here. We're talking about basically an emerging uh, middle class. These people who are engaged in trade start to become very unhappy with the restrictions on trade and the restrictions on industry that uh, are being implied, uh, sorry, imposed upon them by the king's representatives. And they're also not terribly happy about the sort of special privileges that um, uh, the, you know, the now, the aristocracy that is now concentrated in Paris is enjoying. So think about this. You have, you're being taxed. Uh, you don't have representation. There's no, you know, elections, uh, you know. There are, you know, this, um, these bodies of the three estates which come together, but they're, they're not like the English Parliament. They are not, you know, a standing body of representatives for, uh, you know, the towns or for the people of France. So, you know, you are uh, maybe a, a rising businessman, you're engaged in trade, you might have an interest in the law, and yet you're being taxed, you have no representation, and you're also being burdened by all of these commands coming down from the king. This, according to Alexis de Tocqueville, is one of the things that starts to cause the ferment that will ultimately lead to the French Revolution. The people no longer have loyalty to their local aristocracy because the local aristocracy doesn't live with them anymore. And the people also start, especially the richer element in the people, they start not to have uh, so much affection for the king because the king is involved in restric restricting their trade and ordering them, them around in such a, you know, sort of uh, centralized way. And so, uh, you know, in 1789 and then into the early 1790s, the French have a revolution. It's a very bloody revolution. Uh, you know, the, the nobility and the king uh, ultimately wind up, uh, you know, being uh, executed. The, the French Revolution gets rid of the monarchy, it also gets rid of the nobility. The French Revolution tries to establish a democracy of sorts, but it very rapidly turns out to be the case that the most important and powerful institution in the new revolutionary France is the army. And on the political side, uh, this attempt to create a democracy doesn't work so well because different factions, they're not quite political parties in the modern sense, but they have certainly the partisan spirit Different factions, such as the Jacobins and the Girondins, they are at one another's, on one another's throats. They really disagree on principle. They really disagree on you know, the actions that government is going to take. And so partisanship is you know, breaking down government in uh, newly democratized France. Uh, 
and it's leading to a lot of uh, political bloodshed between these different factions. Uh, meanwhile, you have the army, which is by far the strongest in institution in the country at this point. And the, you know, the country is fighting a lot of wars. It's trying to export the revolution to its neighbors, while at the same time, uh, its neighbors, including Britain, are fighting back against uh, the French Revolution. Well, the whole thing is chaotic for a long time, but what eventually winds up happening, perhaps quite predictably, is the rise of a military commander to being in charge of uh, you know, the entirety of France. And this uh, commander is, of course, uh, the famous Napoleon. Uh, I think uh, Netflix right now is in the process of uh, about to release a, uh, a, a sort of epic, uh, you know, uh, uh, epic television production on uh, Napoleon. Uh, Napoleon, you know, is, uh, he, he declares himself an emperor. He declares France an empire. You know, so you've gone from having, uh, you know, the old regime, which was decaying for the reasons Tocqueville says, to then having a democracy that proves very short-lived. And ultimately, you get this military dictatorship, which takes on the name of an empire. Well, Napoleon fights wars with everyone. He fights wars with the Russians, he fights wars with the British, he fights wars with the Austrians, the Prussians, and he fights so many wars he winds up eventually losing. He's a brilliant military commander. He has a you know, tremendously powerful military in the form of the French army, and yet uh, he loses these wars, these Napoleonic wars. Uh, he is ultimately deposed, he's exiled. He comes back from exile, tries to do it again, gets defeated again, gets exiled again. And at the end of all of this, what happens? France is restored to being a monarchy, but a restored monarchy clearly isn't going to last, right? You can't just roll back the clock. You can't just pretend the things that happened with the French Revolution and the rise of Napoleon. Uh, you can't pretend that those things can be undone. And this is the environment in which the young Alexis de Tocqueville is growing up. And, you know, you have the fall of Napoleon, the restoration of the monarchy. There are these tensions as soon as the monarchy is restored, because some people say we should not have restored the monarchy. We should go back to having a democracy. Some people say we should have the restored monarchy, but it should be a constitutional monarchy. There should be limits on the monarch's power. And other people say there should be no limits on the monarch's power. We should go back to the kind of absolute monarchy that we had under Louis XIV, for example. So you have these political factions underneath uh, this you know, sort of newly uh, restored monarchy. And sure enough, the thing proves to be unstable, and there are a series of changes that take place. So first you have a change which leads to a constitutional monarchy in France. The constitutional monarchy is still racked by these problems because, again, it still faces uh, you know, opposition from the ultra-monarchists who want an absolute monarchy, and it's also facing opposition from the Democrats who want to get rid of monarchy altogether. There are you know, a series of revolutions, and then you know, France uh, becomes a republic again, and it adopts a presidential system. And who should decide that he wants to run for president? A nephew of Napoleon by the name of Louis Napoleon. Louis Napoleon uh, is elected as president of France. And then a few years later, he decides, maybe I want to be more than president of France. And so Louis Napoleon also declares himself emperor. He has an enormous amount of support from the public. He isn't supported by uh, you know, the legislature, really, except to the extent that he's bullied the legislature into uh, moving in his direction. But uh, Na Louis Napoleon is basically, he presents himself as being the voice of the people, uh, the voice of you know, the great uh, you know, sort of um, unrepresented you know, masses of the French. Even though France had a democracy, it was a uh, quite limited democracy by the standards of you know, what we would accept today as being fully democratic. And so Napoleon presented himself as a champion of the people, Louis Napoleon, the, this is Napoleon III we're talking about, and uh, he winds up uh, becoming emperor. This was something that Tocqueville had wanted to avoid. The, one of the reasons why Tocqueville comes to America, the reasons why he writes uh, you know, Democracy in America, Volume 1, which is published in 1835, Democracy in America, Volume 2, which is published in 1840, Tocqueville is trying to ask himself, how can a democracy survive? How can it not go the way of the Roman Republic? How can it not go the way of the French Revolution? How can you have uh, self-government uh, that is uh, sustainable, that is, it's not a monarchy, it's not you know, an empire, it's not a military dictatorship, how can this work? And are the Americans really making it work? Tocqueville is very interested to see sociologically uh, you know, what is it about America that seems to be preventing this kind of spiral, this cycle of decay and revolution? The answer that Tocqueville discovers is that the Americans do things locally. Americans have this great talent for association. So America does not have centralized power. Uh, Washington, D.C. is you know, a kind of a backwater southern city at that point. In fact, it's barely even that. Uh, 
and uh, most American government, most of the work that needs to be done, public works, for example, uh, the work of you know, um, uh, you know, building barns, you know, all sorts of things, is being done by the people themselves and their local governments. Right? It's being done uh, in the towns and cities. Uh, even state governments at that point were, were rather small and uh, not very powerful. So Tocqueville looks at this and he recognizes that the kind of function that was once served by the local nobility in France in the Middle Ages and in the early modern period is served in America by association, by Americans themselves coming together, recognizing their needs, working you know, as equals in order to create uh, you know, all of the institutions that they need, all of the uh, you know, public goods that they need, uh, whether it's raising a barn or creating sewers, whatever the case may be, Americans are doing this at the local level. And that is really the genius of the American system. And that's what prevents it from being uh, tyrannical or despotic or being on a path toward, toward Caesarism. And that was the great fear that Tocqueville has. And you can find this expressed very eloquently in uh, the second volume of Democracy in America. But he, Tocqueville talks there. He makes a number of prophecies. And, and Tocqueville is a very far-sighted person. Um, at one point, Tocqueville says that he thinks the, the next century, the 20th century, is going to be uh, divided by a great struggle between uh, you know, uh, America and Russia, that those are the two sort of poles that represent uh, you know, the two directions in which humanity might go. Tocqueville's fear is that even in America, democracy might ultimately destroy itself. It might commit suicide by succumbing to despotism, by succumbing to a kind of Caesarism. And how would it do that? Well, it's if people you know, make the same sort of bargain with centralized power that the French aristocracy, the French nobility, had made with the French king. If they say, rather than ta us taking care of ourselves in our local communities and districts, why don't we simply give up our, our self-responsibility, which is a burden? Why don't we give this up to a central power, ultimately in Washington, D.C., that will take care of us and that will do the, the things that we need done for us? Tocqueville was afraid that this would be such a, you know, a path towards easing life's burdens and uh, the difficulties of self-government and self-responsibility and local self-government that uh, even in America there might be a temptation to give up this idea of localized self-government and instead embrace centralized uh, power. Now this would, uh, you know, according to Tocqueville's uh, you know, view of the world, this could probably lead America to the same sort of crisis that you got in France as local power was drained and centralized uh, in Paris. That uh, what would happen if, you know, in America people felt less connection to, less responsibility for their own local communities, and if they were looking instead to Washington, D.C.? Well, that makes the elections uh, for federal officials all the more important. It makes all federal institutions more important, things like the Supreme Court, for example, but it certainly makes presidential elections extremely important because the president is going to be you know, the most powerful figure in Washington, D.C. He's going to have you know, the most government uh, authority at his uh, disposal. And therefore, you, know, you may very well have uh, people wanting to concentrate power in the presidency and let the president then you know, uh, make um, executive orders, perhaps to forgive uh, student loans, for example, as we've seen in recent years. But that the president will be able to do things for people and help them in ways that uh, they no longer want to do for themselves or help themselves. And uh, you know, once this process gets going, there may be no end to it. And there may be you know, a continual concentration of power in Washington, D.C. that winds up you know, depleting the power of local communities and states. And you can see that um, you know, even in the, the 20th century, so you know, uh, I, I mentioned uh, the New Deal uh, earlier in my remarks, but this concentration of power in Washington, D.C. that starts to grow out of the Great Depression, uh, the election of Franklin Roosevelt, the concentration of power in the New Deal, World War II, because it's you know, this massive war that has to be sort of centrally directed. World War II also concentrates power in Washington, D.C. Uh, the effect of all of this is to start to create a power center that is competing with the local communities and local power centers in America. And uh, throughout the 20th century, this is a dynamic that's taking place, that you have a conflict between uh, local government and centralized uh, political power in Washington, D.C. And this is where um, a lot of the, the forces I described earlier in my talk come into play, that um, you know, big business, which starts to have strong connections in Washington, D.C., or strong connections to political leaders, uh, it feels rather um, you know, good about centralized power to some degree. Uh, 
And uh, you know, there are num numbers of forces that are you know, in favor of using centralized power uh, you know, against a number of very you know, sort of wrong and iniquitous and vile things that the states have been doing. So for example, it makes perfect sense that you'd want the federal government to step in to you know, fight against uh, segregation or fight against you know, sort of unequal application of the law to different American citizens. So there's a, a logic to the concentration of power in Washington, D.C. It's not all simply a cynical process. But at the same time as that's happening, you're necessarily also going to be having um, a concentration of power which weakens or changes the balance in America, shifts it towards this uh, sort of despot des despotic or Caesaristic uh, kind of uh, system that Tocqueville had been afraid of. And because the central government has more and more power, it's able to make decisions that are more and more important for Americans' lives. Think about something like free trade, for example. Um, you know, it used to be that your senator would be very strongly connected to the economic interests within your own state. He would, you know, he or she would stand up for the uh, economic interests of that state against, you know, the idea that uh, there was, you know, sort of one uh, economic formula that would be good not just for the whole country but for the whole world. Well, things have changed over time. However, senators and, and uh, members of Congress, they came to be very unhappy with the idea that they were being forced to make these difficult votes between uh, you know, people who are saying, we're going to lower prices for consumers by having more free trade, and uh, producers who are saying, free trade is bad because it's going to take away jobs in your district or in your, your state. Senators and congressmen decide they don't like being you know, forced to come down on one side or the other of that uh, challenge. And instead they say, well, let's just you know, give the trade negotiating authority to the president. Let's let the president's representatives, you know, appointed representatives, have these debates in secret with other governments. And they will create free trade deals. And then we'll basically you know, rubber stamp those free trade deals. They'll be far too complex for us to understand anyway. This kind of you know, concentration of power in Washington and depletion of power uh, in the states, and then the sort of uh, continuing cycle that this generates of changes in our economy, Change in the, in the, changes in the way people relate, uh, not just to you know, the government in Washington, D.C., but even how they think about local government, how they think about their own neighborhoods, how they think about themselves even, whether they see themselves as being you know, sort of in a conflict that's nationwide with people who have you know, abstract ideas that are different from their own. Uh, that's what happens when you have the concentration of power at the national scale. Whereas when you have a you know, decentralization of power that is more localized, uh, people are then more worried about you know, concrete issues of, hey, how is this barn going to get built? How is this sewer going to get cleaned? How can we do things locally? And again, the American system from the beginning, if you go back and look at the Federalist Papers, if you look at the Constitution itself, it is federal. It's not simply a matter of every locality, every state for itself. There are you know, balances that are you know, there in order to make sure that uh, the states cannot commit gross injustices. And those, those checks have often failed. And so there ha have had to be you know, sort of new powers created that would redress uh, various evils that America, American states and localities have fallen prey to. So it's not the case that you, know, you can always say that uh, you know, concentrated power and central power is bad, but it always tends to play into this sort of bad pattern that Tocqueville had recognized, which leads you know, towards uh, you know, uh, the search for a savior figure, the search for a singular polit political leader who will use the concentrated power of Washington, D.C to deliver exactly what you want. And the idea here, of course, is that every, you know, every citizen, every you know, member of either party uh, can easily trick themselves into believing that what the president will do with all the concentrated power is exactly what that particular citizen wants, that you know, they're going to be taken care of themselves. When in fact, you know, it turns out that because people want different things, uh, no president is able to deliver all these things. So people become disillusioned, there's tension, there's ongoing you know, sort of partisan conflict. And uh, you see that even as this happens, people are unwilling to sort of de-escalate and return decision making more locally. Instead, they keep looking to a you know, overall solution that can't be found at the level of centralized power. This creates you know, a great deal of cynicism about our institutions. It creates the idea that America is ungovernable. It creates the impression that citizens are enemies to one another. And it creates the impression that um, you know, we just have to find the right kind of political leader who's going to deliver us from these problems. And so you know, I mean, people look at the cult of personality that attaches to so many presidents. And uh, you know, think about someone like Barack Obama, who you know, ran on a campaign whose slogans were hope and change. And Barack Obama was seen as a figure who would really uh, you know, drastically uh, change America for the better by the people who voted for him. 
And there was a lot of disappointment, and you see this uh, manifested by things like um, the Occupy Wall Street movement during the uh, Obama years, for example. There was a great deal of disappointment among Obama's own supporters that he couldn't deliver all of the salvation that voters had hoped for and expected of him. You see the same sort of things uh, among Republicans. You see you know, leaders rise and fall in terms of uh, the significance that their own voters place upon them, depending on whether, they, uh, you know, whether voters think that they are able to deliver that for them or not. And ultimately what winds up happening is that it's easier to fight the other side and to say, well, this other side uh, is terrifying. So it's not that I am necessarily going to be, be able to deliver the things that you want for your own life, but I will at least stop the other side from taking things from you uh, that you need to have. And the other side, you know, if they get into power, they'll be really dangerous. Therefore, you need to concentrate power with me as a protector against, uh, you know, the wolf at your door. Both the Republicans and the Democrats uh, today indulge in this. So you can see these things, these forces are closely correlated with the idea of both Caesarism and populism in American politics right now. And uh, I think these underlying currents are one of the reasons why you're starting to see a shift among conservatives in the way they think. And they're thinking increasingly in terms of national politics. They're thinking increasingly in terms of, uh, you know, presidential power concentrated in the executive. And, uh, and they're thinking more about uh, the use of government power in general, especially at the national level, but also, you know, at the state level. All of these things, you know, perhaps, uh, you know, taking the place of what otherwise would be uh, local uh, you know, attempts at self-government. You're seeing the conservatives themselves are being pulled along in this direction. Uh, at first they were doing it partly as a, a way of resisting progressives, but now uh, it's become something that they themselves are sort of trapped in the cycle and going further and further in that direction. Now I will uh, just wrap up very quickly by saying I do think there is a, uh, a way to break this cycle and it requires getting your hands dirty because you actually do have to use a certain measure of national power, a certain measure of concentrated power, a certain measure perhaps even of ex executive power in order to break this cycle and start to reverse it. So again, think about trade. Um, with free trade, uh, powers were voluntarily given up by uh, Congress people and senators who did not want to you know, be embarrassed by the votes they were forced to make. They gave power to the executive. They said to the executive, okay, uh, you can now uh, you know, be the one making these decisions. Um, the executive then you know, delegated that, that, the president would delegate that power to uh, you know, appointed officials. Those appointed officials would act on the basis not of you know, uh, being elected to represent people because they weren't elected at all. They instead would um, represent technical expertise. And uh, the idea that, well, okay, we have been selected for this you know, committee to negotiate these trade deals, uh, or we are the bureaucrats who've been you know, put into our careers in order to do this because we have special knowledge that ordinary people do not possess. We understand the global economy much better than ordinary folks do. And therefore, it is only proper that the best kind of economic results be constructed by the best economic thinkers. And that's what we, as unelected officials, are going to do. Well, that's a very seductive vision for people with uh, you know, educational credentials, but it's lacking in democratic accountability. It's lacking in democratic legitimacy. And so I think you cannot be surprised by the kind of populist blowback that you're getting here. Instead, what I think has to happen is that first of all, um, presidents have to take actions uh, using these powers that have been concentrated in their hands to begin to strengthen our localities. And that includes breaking away, and uh, just because it's, I think, a, a very clear uh, illustration, breaking away from free trade ideology and saying we really have to restore the idea of regional economies within our country. It can't all be sort of looked at as uh, one undifferentiated mass where, you know, you've got Wall Street and you've got Silicon Valley and uh, tech companies and insurance companies and, and you know, hospitals and things. Those are going to be the economic winners everywhere and you know, uh, hard industry uh, making refrigerators or cars or televisions or whatever, that's always going to be the loser. Instead, I think presidents have to you know, strengthen the idea of local economies that are somewhat buffered against uh, the global economy if you want to strengthen the idea that economic decisions made at the local level matter. And what that will hopefully do is start to reinvigorate local government because local government is of course very strongly connected to the idea of the economic decisions that are made locally about local industries, about where you can put a factory for example, about uh, you know, where you build a road in order to you know, help out uh, you know, sort of one industry, 
uh, and those resources are limited, so of course that has to come out of you know, a budget that could otherwise be used for something else. But the more that you can restore economic localism through you know, the correct use of the powers that have already been concentrated in the executive, the more that might help in turn to revitalize political localism. Political localism can then start to assert itself more strongly in Congress and in taking powers away from the executive and thereby restoring this idea of a more representative local self-government and a, you know, a sense of federalism again as opposed to a sense of uh, you know, Caesarism where power has to be concentrated in one you know, sort of political savior figure. There are a number of other things I could get into that uh, follow a similar kind of path. But I think this gives you, I think you know, the example of free trade is a good one because it shows the way in which uh, you know, we've gotten to where we are, but also how you know, we can actually, uh, we don't have to despair, we don't have to think, look, we lost the Constitution, we don't, we're, we're not the founding fathers, we can't do what they did. We don't have to do what they did. What we have to do basically is, is start where we are with this concentration of power and realize how you can then go from there to a greater devolution. And you know, it's not just a matter of pure altruism or selflessness from you know, a president who says, gosh, I'm just gonna give up my power, because that by, by itself won't work. You can't just give up power, you actually have to turn it over to someone else. So if you continue to have a Congress that does not want to take responsibility for itself, if you continue to have the sense that decisions that are made in Brussels or Beijing may be more important to you economically than the decisions that are made in your state capital or in the town that is next door to yours, if that's the case, then you, you, there's no one who will be able to take up the power that a president could turn over to them. Instead, you have to start building these other you know, power centers, these other centers of responsibility, and then they will be in a position to take responsibility for themselves when the opportunity is once again afforded for the devolution of power. That, I think, is the way to uh, restore something like the Tocquevillian vision of America. It's, uh, I don't want to say that it's an easy task. I don't want to say this is a silver bullet. There will always be tensions. There will always be conflicts. But we need to understand this great pattern that Tocqueville illustrated for us. Because if we don't, we really are going to be on the same path that the Romans found themselves on, that the, the, uh, the French Revolution, uh, the, sorry, that the French old regime found itself on that led to the French Revolution. Uh, and that, uh, you know, in, in Tocqueville's own time, uh, you know, a France that had become a constitutional monarchy ultimately, you know, uh, became not a democracy, but an empire, which didn't last very long in itself, as a result of uh, these kinds of political forces. The failure to get right, the distribution of power between a center and a periphery. Populism is a correct response to genuinely corrupt elites. It is a correct response to a situation in which, uh, you know, people uh, have been ill-served by leaders in Washington, D.C., who have so much power that uh, local interests, especially local economic interests, have been betrayed. So populism is understandable in that sense, but the key is to go beyond populism to the reinvestment of authority and power and self-responsibility in the local communities from which you know, this populist uprising is being generated. Uh, I think doing that is the way to go from populism back to a kind of localized self-government. And if you don't do that, if instead you get the balance wrong and you continue to have just endless national battles, endless concentration of power, uh, you're only going to have more and more stronger waves of populism, not just on the right, but also on the left. I think Bernie Sanders is only the beginning of the kind of populism you might see uh, coming from the left. And you're going to have you know, conditions that will be, if not like those of the French Revolution or if not like those uh, that brought uh, Louis Napoleon to power in, in France in the 19th century, nevertheless conditions that will lead in the direction of what uh, Alexis de Tocqueville described as democratic despotism. So with that, I will wrap up. Thank you very much, Mr. McCarthy, for joining us here in Louisville for what's been a very engaging and introspective oh. conversation. Thank you. On behalf of the uh, McCall Center, I'd like to bring you with a small gift. And those of you joining online, thank you for joining us and participating. And if you can look out for more lectures in the future, we most, appreciate it. Thank you.